If you feel the groove, move. I just started recording, so we'll make sure we get your moves on our recording. <laughs> ben, maybe you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I think we've got a good group here going, so I'm going to welcome everyone into our community call. Uh, this is our fourth Tuesday community call, and I'm, I apologize. There's been a little confusion because I have two invites out there to everyone. They're each a monthly invite, so they repeat, but once for the second Tuesday and once for the fourth Tuesday. So folks have been like, wait, is there another call this month? I thought there was another one. Yes, there is. It's today. It's now. So thank you for reaching out if you had questions, and I apologize that that's been confusing. We're excited about today's call, excited to see so many uh, familiar faces here and a few new ones too. So welcome. If this is your first community call, we're glad you're here. We've got folks all over North America and even outside of North America here on this call. So welcome. <laughs> um, I want to introduce our guest host. I don't know what we would even call you, Janine, maybe our facilitator for today. But I want to also give some announcements and give you a little background about what we're doing. Um, so let me start with some announcements. I think that'll be the simplest. I have two announcements for you. The next one is that our next call is going to be on Tuesday, October 13. And on that call, I'm going to be giving you a little tour of our Mighty Networks platform. So we have a, a regular static website that folks can visit the retreatcentercollaboration.org and learn about what we're doing. And many of you subscribe to be a part of these calls through that website. But we also have uh, another website that we're developing that is going to be a social space for us to interact. So it's through Mighty Networks. It's just for the Retreat Center collaboration. So it's for folks like the ones on this call to get together and continue the conversations that we're having on these community calls. So we'll be doing uh, kind of a walkthrough and Q&A and we'll explore that space together on our next call, October 13th. So I wanted to mention that. And then I also wanted to mention that this morning I was on, as well as several other folks on the call here today, I was on a webinar put on by the Fetzer Institute, which helps support the work that we do with the Retreat Center collaboration. And they've done a recent study on spirituality. And so I wanted to share that link because I think it was, well, for one, this is, you know, this is my like specialty. I, I'm fascinated by this kind of work. And so anything that has a study about spirituality, I wanna know about it, but I think you might wanna know about it too. So I'll put that link in the chat um, if you wanna peek at what they're learning about all of us right now in this time of division and crisis and learning about ourselves. We're also all learning about what it means to be spiritual, not spiritual, religious, not religious, and every blend in between. Some people said, I'm not spiritual at all, but I identify as a religion. I'm not religious at all, but I identify as a religion. So these amazing mixes of identity that are a part of all the people that we serve at our retreat centers, really interesting stuff. So I hope you'll take a second to look at that. Today's conversation is going to be with Janing Wu, who's our guest facilitator. She's not really a guest though, she's been a key part of the Retreat Center collaboration this whole time. Um, and so she's been uh, the Director of Operations at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center in Occidental, California. And she recently took on a new role as the Board Director for Holistic Centers Network. So we're gonna be using a bunch of acronyms today and I wanted to apologize in advance because I sometimes get confused even though I'm talking about these things every day. So we're gonna put a legend in the chat too, so that if we start rattling off acronyms, you know what we're talking about. Um, I want to welcome Janine. Janine volunteered her time to join us for this call and to share with us some of the teaching that she's been doing with Holistic Centers Network, to give us some background on that, and then to share with us a collaborative platform that we can use for our own work going forward, and then we can all talk together about what we want to do next after today's call. So Janine, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ben. Um, I just want to take a moment to look at all your beautiful postcards. 
and maybe invite you to do the same. Just take a moment to look at everybody that's here, even those we can't see, we, we see um, names at least. But just to take a moment. Um, we're going to go into breakouts. First thing, just to do our welcome and grounding, because I think it's important to know who's in the room. And if we were in a big space and this was a four hour session, we would have time to do it in this beautiful big circle. I'm going to call it a circle. I'm thinking of a circle in my head. Um, but so we're going to break you out probably in groups of three for 10 minutes and would invite you to introduce yourself to your colleagues that you may or may not know yet, um, and answer two questions. Why you showed up, and what does JEDI mean to you? And just take some time, use those prompts, and um, get to know each other. So, yes, hopefully you can see the, uh, the acronyms there in the chat. Um, and hopefully you can remember those two questions. Can we put those questions in the chat too, so folks can have them with Why did you come today? And what is your understanding of Jedi? What do you think Jedi means to you, for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a bunch of breakout rooms ready to go. So I'll see you all in 10 minutes and we'll all check back in here. So goodbye. How are you? All right. I'm going to resume. Oh, that's funny. Resume, you know. Sorry. <laughs> resume with a Z. I see where you're going. Yeah. Resume. When you give people a chance to introduce themselves and then breakout rooms close and they don't want to come back, that's a good sign. Energy field. <laughs> Welcome all. I hear some lawnmowers or something out there. Jackhammer. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you all met new friends or uh, connected with old ones. If everybody's back, I have to share my Jedi lightsaber chopstick yeah. and my Star Wars cup with Yoda Jedi master on it because we are, if what I listen to Jen Ying talk about, we are Jedi Knights. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Pat and Tracy. They were in my group. I actually wasn't planning on being on a, in a breakout, but oh, I loved it. And um, I, I'm thinking we need a session on how Jedi actually, um, or how the Jedi fiction movie actually applies to Jedi work, because there is a lot of metaphorical truth to all of it. But that's for another day. Anyway, um, so glad to be with you all. And I'm going to dive right in because we're a little behind schedule, but um, that's okay. Yeah because life is about planning and then being open to the emergent. So we'll see what happens. And thank you, Ben, for introducing me. That saved me a few uh, or a minute of my time having to talk about myself, which most of you know I'm not very good at. But what I would love to share with you is that I'm really passionate about retreat centers. Um, that's also another day for cocktails and reflections, but for some reason I am. And I really feel um, retreat centers have a, necessary and essential role in our world and in the healing of, of people. Um, and so when I was asked to um, uh, facilitate a Jedi session because of Jedi circles that I've held, um, I was really um, excited and then I got inspired. So I'm going to be doing this session in a way I've never done before and sharing in a way that's new to me because, um, and I want to throw this to Jean at Kirkridge. Um, my first time I met Jean, she mentioned something in a circle about how retreat centers are a place of where pride magic happens. And so today what I'd like to do is to bring a little bit of the practical with a little bit of the magic that we all um, do in our retreat centers. So with that, um, I, like uh, Ben said, I'm going to use an online platform and a visual collaborative uh, framework. So I'm going to share my screen. 
And if anybody can't see that, and I'm going to start flying blind, meaning I'm going to put all your little squares somewhere else. I can't see you. So Ben and Justine, you're welcome to interrupt me and say, uh, stop <laughs> at any time, but I can only hear now. I can't see. Um, so this is the mural uh, platform. Think of it as an online whiteboard. And so um, I'm going to take you on a journey in the framework. One, using it to introduce you to JEDI, as Ben put in the chat. JEDI stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And then we're going to harvest some collective wisdom, and we'll do that um, in the back half of this. Um, I am a deeply process and systems geek, and it's really important for me to always zoom out and see the bigger picture. Um, and so that way I can sort of understand when I'm zoomed in sort of where I am in the orientation of the landscape. And so breaking things down is always helpful. So I thought inviting you guys to see the process design that went through with Ben and Justine and I in terms of how we were thinking about this session would be interesting. So with that, we're going to zoom in into the process design. So this is us, all of us little people with the red dot. And where we're going to start our journey with is the background that Jedi is relevant to our work. And we don't know how to move our centers forward, dot, dot, dot. The reason for the ellipsis is because we're all going to finish that sentence in our own unique ways, depending um, on our own centers. So we're just going to leave that open ended. And then the purpose of this session is to equip centers with a JEDI lens to deepen their impact on social change. And so a lot of our centers are mission-driven organizations that are trying to either heal, uh, raise consciousness, or basically um, be in service of humanity. Um, and so how do we do that? And how can we do that with a JEDI lens? And we'll, we'll go into that, so don't, don't worry about that. We have a few objectives, four to say the least. <laughs> One is uh, we hope that we'll be able to show just or help you all just have a basic understanding of JEDI. This is just going to be touching the surface. I mean, JEDI work can go deep. Um, but for this session, we're just going to have a basic understanding. We're going to learn how to use the JEDI lens in any work, meaning how the JEDI lens can be used to look at anything. We'll share collective wisdom in the room, the collaborative process, and hopefully identify some opportunity areas. Um, we do have some, we've planned some concrete results in designing this in that at the end of this uh, session, hopefully those who want to, and you can always opt out, um, is to identify one concrete action your center can take. We'll also be sharing this mural as a PDF um, for you all and this recording. So you'll have that as well. And then we'll end the session. Got to take us little people up. Oops, zooming out. We'll take our little people and hopefully um, we'll end the session with some time to think through next steps. Um, and again, these are just what Ben, Justine and I popped in as um, ideas. They're not what, you know, may happen, but we could follow up with a community call, we could explore the mighty networks, and we can look at maybe, you know, going deeper into the work of Jedi. So how we're going to do that, I'm going to ask that we all uh, practice these principles today of being curious, being creative, and being authentic. And I think they're quite simple, but also very expansive. Um, and hopefully we'll um, open ourselves to thinking outside of the box in a way, in, in um, idi idiomatic language. Um, the other thing about this landscape is then in moving to the content, what I wanted to do, because a lot of times when we talk about Jedi or concepts, um, visual, uh, visually identifying them, and in this case, using icons is helpful so that what I see in my head or what I'm thinking as I'm translating it or transmitting it to you all, um, that it lands sort of the same. So I've found this work really helpful to, to do it this way. Um, you know, um, for example, with justice, equity, diver diversity, and inclusion, you see, you know, three humans or star people is what I call them, um, with different shapes and different colors, and they're all on the same platform. And so, for me, that is how I would represent what justice, equity, diversity, inclusion means to me. 
And we're going to look at uh, Jedi in three ways. We're going to go through a three-step process. We're going to talk about its relevance, identify opportunities, and also identify some action. Um, in the work that I do, and also uh, just me in general, I use the analogy of a balloon representing um, an idea or an uh, initiative or a thought, but I need it tethered to something, something tangible that I can then go and do something with, especially when we talk about social movement. The social piece a lot, we can wax and wane, um, but the movement part is always the part where um, we all need help and support. So when we talk about revel uh, relevance with Jedi, imagine this circle being the circle of your center and then this bottom circle, the circle of Jedi. So where they intersect in that eye is sort of, are there um, aha moments? Are there insights of where these two meet? And it could necessarily you know, be uh, that those two circles don't meet. Um, but for the most part, we haven't taken the time to really look at that and look at it through that lens. Um, and so that's why understanding relevance is important. Once we understand the relevance of it, then we can identify opportunities. And how I think about opportunities in the Jedi work is not one person going it alone and having all these options. It's, there's actually a, a support um, foundation to any person or persons or even a center that then they can truly manifest these opportunities and then move into action something. So there's my little star person with a, you know, check the box and, and, and movement. So, um, and this is a great uh, activity to do when you're thinking about these complex issues um, in that, I, and I'll just speak for myself, it engages my whole person versus just my, my intellect. So that's our process design. And so how we're going to do that, um, rather than going through sort of like a Jedi training, which I, I'd probably be the worst person to, to teach it to you. I'm sure there's, there's um, far um, more uh, academic written um, things about this, but mine is through lived experience as well as storytelling. So I wanted to share um, two stories in moving into the relevance piece. Is everybody um, following so far? Okay, I think I heard a yes. Yes, lots of heads nodding. Great. Um, I'm glad you all can, well, maybe you all don't see me. Hopefully you hid me, but um, I wanted to go through to tell you two stories. One is OAEC's journey. And, um, and again, I just want to uh, sidebar a note and uh, thank, thank you, Ben. Um, again, when you're in a collaborative process and designing things, I, I always believe more heads are better than one. Um, he had, when I originally showed this to him, there was a few things that were missing and, and he needed sort of like a, a title or something to hold this visual. And so um, when I think about Oasis journey, if I had to uh, summarize it, it's really preparing the house for our guests and I'll explain that. So the blue text here represent formal OAEC events that happen. And then the red text will be the organic um, activities within the organization that happen. So OAEC, since its founding, I think 1994 was when we were incorporated, but in 1997, um, we started hosting groups. So we've always been connected with social movement organizations. Um, and that's always been part of who we are. So in a way you can think of it as a DNA kind of a thing. So we never thought of, of social justice and equal just, eco, sorry, eco justice as separate or something there, but it was just how we showed up in the world. Fast forward to 2018. The reason I start at 2018 is because that was when we finished, I think uh, like a 10 year capital building campaign of really upgrading our site to um, be a movement building center. And two things um, that are important in that is that one, uh, we made a conscious decision that um, we needed to upgrade our site so that the folks that didn't wanna sleep in a four bunk bed 
you know, eight person yurt <laughs> would want to come to OAEC so that again, we can amplify our work to more people. But the other also was we were very intentional in wanting to only service a niche um, audience, which we decided were social movement organizations. And so in 2018, when the meeting hall was finally um, done, we invited all 40, there was 40 people who showed up, which include out, included hourly and our core staff, to uh, all, um, an all staff one day uh, white supremacy training. And we invited an organization who was white led because um, we are predominantly white organization. So to have white people teach white people um, is appropriate. Um, and really sort of, again, there are trainers who do this professionally to help us understand the context in a way where we could serve our guests um, better. Um, and so that was really helpful. And only, as you'll see, a short year later, we had a half day retreat. And what's interesting about that for a socially, you know, social justice minded organization who this is our DNA, you would think we have this perfect and, you know, we would be the model of um, an exemplary model. However, this work, like I said to Pat and Tracy in our breakout is messy and it's wrought with challenges. Um, but that's the space of, of learning. That's the space where there is actual liberation. And I'll say that just for myself. But the reason we had this half day retreat was actually because um, I think maybe a month before that, we hosted a group and it was 20 plus people. They were their 20 somethings from an urban setting. They didn't know each other, even though it was a group that was coming together. The facilitators had uh, curated this, this group of strangers and they were here, they were coming to OAC for a two week retreat. And during just the first week, our hospitality got questioned. Our guests told us that um, they were experiencing microaggressions from our staff. Um, our vegetarian fare led to a boycott of meals. So guests were actually not showing up for dinner and going down to the local watering hole for burgers and beers. And our beautiful, serene country natural setting suddenly was this very uncomfortable, inconvenient um, setting of bugs and, you know, taking showers with spiders and, you know, and the evenings being too dark and too quiet. So that, that shook us up internally as a staff. And also as a staff, you know, we had moved from being this uh, collective staff of sort of long-term folks that had been with the organization since its founding or even a few years after to suddenly new staff that were less than, you know, seven, five, even two years old. And so that, that was the impetus for this. And that was helpful because as a staff then, we were able to process um, some of the more uh, nebulous spaces of, again, we are, we welcome people on our site as if they're family. So to have any of our guests say that they were experiencing microaggressions, you know, we, we had to understand what, what's our role in, and sort of draw lines between what's personal to us and, and how we need to show up professionally. Um, and then in the in-between spaces, what was happening sort of in an organic way was staff in, in the fall of 2018, um, I had come back from a retreat with Reverend Kyoto Angel Williams, who is a Black American activist and a Zen Buddhist priest. Some of you may know her. Um, and so coming back, um, somehow I was moved to uh, there's a story behind that, but I won't um, go into that. But I was moved to start discussion circles, meaning creating spaces where people can talk about the issues of race or of Jedi at the time, but it wasn't called that yet, um, in a brave space, but in a safe space, meaning someone could say something that might offend someone else, but it's, again, it's, it's moving from not about response and defensiveness, but it's that we need to we need to learn to hear each other and, and hear in a way that that's your lived experience versus, um, versus a reflection on me. Um, and so in that uh, discussion circles, we came up with a foundational um, agreements for all of our, you know, what now is our Jedi circles of one, we show up with personal responsibility. We speak our truth, which means our lived experience. 
Um, and we, and in the deep listening, one of the practices that we don't get to respond, we don't respond to what someone else shares and, and, you know, riff off our, you know, thoughts or reflections of what we think of what their thought is. So you really have to, as an individual, sit and practice of being and being in presence and being in, um, okay. in whether you feel good about something or you don't, and just feeling that in your body. And so from that in 2019, we again built a layer upon that in forming formalizing Jedi Circle. So what was DEI at the time? Um, one of our program directors, she had heard of the term Jedi that some organizations added the J, which is justice, and that felt appropriate for us. So thus, we also adopted the acronym Jedi for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and then this year, um, the Jedi space, so I differentiate Jedi space and Jedi circle in that the Jedi space is those agreements that I mentioned before. And when COVID happened, because of the landscape of experiences our staff was feeling and needing a place to process that, we, while we didn't talk Jedi, we held the kind of same Jedi space for those discussions. And then what was interesting was organically led to realizing um, actually there is a Jedi lens to our COVID responses and how we show up and support each other. So that was interesting. And then now um, this summer and then this fall, we've now moved into using curriculum to anchor our discussions. So um, Jedi continues to move forward. And I think within the staff, I think what's interesting and unique about OAEC is that um, it's, it's lived life has always been a, an ally in this work and always doing the external piece. However, um, it's never been internalized in terms of uh, formal um, relationships. And I think that's where OAC sort of, you know, um, evolution internally as staff is how do we, um, you know, do this work internally, given that we do it externally, which I know is the opposite for a lot of retreat centers um, who are, are a little different than, than um, OAEC in the example of trying to get people who do a lot of their inner work to actually manifest into external action. So it's a little different there. Um, and then the other story, which is a little different than OAEC's, is the HCN journey. And again, to summarize that, is more about meeting the moment, which appropriately enough was the theme of our virtual gathering this year in May. And in the HCN journey, the blue here is um, the annual uh, holistic centers gathering that we have. And then the red is what's been happening within the network centers. So in the blue, um, and I'm, again, I'm just starting with recent history in 2018 at Omega, it just so happened we also invited Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams and she just did a, a short session, I think it was maybe 40 minutes or so, um, on diversity. And the theme of that, uh, that year was um, looking at diversity in one, how do we bring in um, more people that aren't the same people that, that come through our center. So we're talking about Omega and Esalen and Hollyhock and um, as such. And also within our staff, how do we diversify our staff? Because we realize the people coming to our retreat centers and the people we hire in our retreat centers are all still predominantly white. Um, and we want to, we want to diversify, diversify, but how? So that was the theme of that year which then the, the following year, the theme was intergenerational transfer. And what's interesting, there was an event at the beginning of the, um, the retreat uh, or the gathering that sort of um, shifted the whole gathering to have a Jedi lens in a way. What had happened was there was one session where the question of equity and the question of justice came up and it was around money and, and how it's accessible to all. And, and so in that, there was, um, because of that conversation, Hollyhock had a night session impromptu where we talked about Jedi, meaning we talked about justice and equity and our work in it. And then throughout the rest of the gathering, whether we were talking about leadership or marketing, that theme came up. So I, I say that because um, as I shared in my breakout,
when we were thinking about um, how to reframe that categorization of social justice, because um, when you looked at all the other sessions that were in social justice, it was all people of color. And um, Joelle Tan, who um, is a, a very good friend and, and my co-conspirator in, uh, or I'm his co-conspirator, I should say, in the Jedi work at HCN, um, we had talked about like, you know, Jedi isn't about social justice. It's not just that, it's, it's what it's been boxed in, but it's actually, it's, it's almost like leadership or um, fundraising, or it's, it's, um, it's actually about resilience and emergence. And once we reframed it that way, there were so many more sessions that were connected with the Jedi session, because everything that you looked at, when you look at using Jedi through a creative lens of um, reimagining reemergence resilience, um, it has so many ways to apply cross board, which you all get to you know, experience that when we do our collaborative process. Um, so in between uh, the 2019 and 2020 period, HCN had a group of network members that just wanted to get together. And again, as all things emergent and, and you know, <laughs> love, I love that I work in organizations that you know, aren't your typical hierarchical or like you know, bureaucratic, they just got together and just met once a month and called themselves the DEI group. And so what we ended up doing was, um, I think it was like a seven month process. And each month we just did a case study. We had one center step into wanting to do a case study of something that was, you know, about their center and Jedi or DEI work at the time. And then what that culminated to was um, this year at the virtual gathering, we created, we shared a matrix. And that matrix was all of our learnings from the, that seven month process. So now here in year two, what we're doing is actually we've created a structure of looking at each of those words, each of those letters in the words of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion to really um, uh, embody. Are you guys getting that feedback? Okay, I think we're good. So we're gonna take a look at each of those words and do our own personal work and journey in the in-between spaces, um, meaning you know, from the time we meet to the next time we meet. And then the last three months, I think March, April, May, and again, it's an aspirational idea right now, but to actually as a group, if we feel we're being led into, um, create some kind of a shared language with them, which we can propose um, to the network at our next um, Holistic Centers gathering in 2021, which hopefully will be in person. So when I look at this terrain of HCN's journey, and again, my experience of these last few years in terms of meeting the moment, there's been a cultural shift in um, what's, what's happening in society. The Holistic Centers are feeling it. And some are feeling it from, um, uh, I feel it out there space, and others, it's actually happening in their house. I was telling Ben and Justine of a story uh, in, in DEI 1, where um, one of our ashrams had a guest in their um, uh, gift shop um, accuse them of cultural appropriation because one of their stained glass window um, uh, set Thing, yeah, stained glass windows that they were selling was an image or a picture of something that was actually from their tribe. Um, and, and so like, what do you do when that happens? It's like an oh shit moment. And, and so the centers that are involved in the Jedi group are trying to figure out like, how do I become more educated? How do I become more ex um, learned? Uh, whether it's through academic education or reading or just the lived experience. And, and what we do um, with it at the HCN um, piece is both a head heart approach because we, we know there's learnings, but then there's also an embodiment piece, an experiential piece that is important to um, make it sort of a, a, a whole learning. So with that two stories, as, we, as I'm about to move us into a collaborative process, is the first thing is about the relevance of all this. And so if I had to, and let's see if I can, so there's a little bit of my relevance icon, but if I had to encapsulate or summarize, like what are the takeaways of relevance in these two stories, just these two stories, 
um, we can look at it as one, there was a strong interest in the staff within centers. So there was something in the OAEC experience where the um, relevance of JEDI was actually coming from the staff that were there. Um, another takeaway is that our society is changing and affecting who comes in that was relevant in the HCN story. Um, also, what's going on in the world right now, you know, um, since George Floyd's murder, um, the global acknowledgement of um, systems of oppression um, and in our North American context of um, racism and disproportionate um, inequalities. They're just forefront. So if we as centers don't think that that's going to come into our house, or we're going to have to meet that. Um, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> I, I'm not one to um, uh, advocate for anything. I'm, I'm always a little too open minded. But um, logically, at least in my data driven brain, it just it's inevitable for this to come to OAEC, um, even if OAEC wasn't a social movement organization. Um, the other relevant piece, I think what I've experienced, it, it actually amplifies our work and our ability to be relevant. If we are social movement organizations, it actually, there, there, there is this I, there is this connection between our work and, and what society needs. Um, in terms of what I didn't mention was the who that tends to show up, more so in OAEC, the networks are a little different, um, but they're the younger generation, those that, are, that speak up, that show up, that are really passionate about this space is a lot of millennials and Gen Zs. Um, and then myself, I'm a, a Gen Xer. <laughs> And then um, the other thing that I would say as far as Jedi work's concerned is in doing this work um, and then also living it my whole life, just not calling it Jedi, um, it's actually training in adaptive management. There's no playbook here. There's no steps like you do eight, you know, steps one through 10 and you'll succeed. It's, it's not your traditional, excuse me, like business organization training um, or, or business management 101. It's actually um, a, a different kind of training, and I would just call it for now adaptive management. Um, in both the stories, OAEC and HCN, um, it's been, uh, yeah, emergent, adaptive, and planning. And, and if you can think of those three things, all sort of in a multi-dimensional shared space, that's, that's the way I would draw it in my head. So with that, we'll zoom out into the bigger picture again. And in our collaborative space, what I wanna do with the, the rest of our time is, um, this is a template that I uh, came up with. Now, I didn't come up with this circle thing. Now, that was a template, but how I've used this template and coming up with this particular template or framework is, that relevance actually moves us into opportunities. That when we think about what's relevant, we can then identify where are opportunities if we, if we go into that imaginative space. Um, and then in, once we identify what are the opportunities and brainstorm them, then we can go into action. Meaning like, so if this is our opportunity, um, what is that one action I can take to, to just manifest that opportunity. And in a way, this continues. I see a lot of life as it's, it's very circular. There, it's not linear. Um, concepts, ideas, conversations, life in general is, is more circular than it is linear. Um, and so if I take these you know, pieces here that's relevance and put them in this, what would be the pieces that we would put in here for opportunities. So what we're going to do is, I'm gonna stop share real quick so I can see all your faces. Cause then I know um, how much I've oversaturated you or unsaturated you. <laughs> um, but what, we'd like, to, what uh, we'd like to do is now break you guys out. Um, but before that, we're gonna have a moment of reflection. And so, I wanted to have a moment of reflection because when there's such a big download, um, our minds go, or we're just like drawing a blank or it's flown over our head. All of those are beautifully possible. So I'm gonna, um, 
I'm going to ask in the next five minutes, uh, I'm going to play a song. You can either listen to the words, but again, remembering our principle of being creative, being curious, and being real or being authentic. Think about your center, your center story. Whatever Jedi means to you, look at it through that lens to think of relevance. And then um, begin the, the brainstorming in your brain. And it doesn't have to be a lot, but just like what opportunities are that, that you can come up with. Don't judge, don't adjudicate, don't edit, just riff. I love this word, I've been using it a lot. And then um, come in and then from there flow into action. Meaning like pick one opportunity you wrote down and what can I actually do? Um, and so I know that's a lot. So here's the other invitation. Also just listen to the music and just let your mind wander. Um, Pat and, uh, asked me a question in the breakout about like how I do this and its presence. And, and I think if anything I've learned from HCN's experience was um, the Holistic Centers Network experience is um, being open to the emerging. Sometimes my thinking actually gets in the way of the insights that are waiting to come from other spaces or places whether that's my heart or I, I call her the universe. So with that, um, I just wanna have five minutes for you all just to process this, how you process it. And again, um, there are some prompts, but you don't have to follow them either. I believe in open doors I've taken off the screen I'm ready to let the world come inside And touch my life I will no longer be denied I what someone else believes that I am. And now that I have trapped the weight, I am fly as a man. It's time to elevate. Sober rise, lift your eyes, spread your wings. And break better fly. This is the moment of your life. Go ahead and fly. I believe in open doors on the outside of the bar. What did not demolish me, simply polished me. Now the clearer I can see. I know where I wanna go. Wanna go. I am living in the flow. Oh. Now that I have dropped the weight, I am light as a feather. It's time to elevate. Sober rise, lift your eyes, spread your wings, and prepare to fly. This is the moment of your life. Go ahead and fly. I believe in open doors.
So we'll take another minute just to be in silence. And then we're gonna break you out into groups of two for 10 minutes. So each of you will have five minutes just to reflect. You can talk about your relevance, opportunity and action, or you can just reflect. Use that time to, to share some collaborative, collective wisdom. I have some breakout rooms put together here for pairs. And I see several people have popped off the call, so I'm just making sure I don't send anyone to a room by themselves. That would be kind of a letdown. Ben, can I, can I stay here, Ben? You can, yes. Almost ready. <laughs> Susan, would you like to go to a breakout room? Not really. <laughs> And I don't know who, is there, one? there is one for you. Yes, there is one for you. I don't know where it is. I can just reflect for myself. I've got a group there if you'd like it, go ahead. I'm gonna send 415 to break out room three. What are you doing here, Orrin? <laughs> Orrin doesn't like breakout rooms either. <laughs> He's over it. You're on mute, dear. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm not good with breakout rooms. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm good with you one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> yes. You're my breakout room. They're coming back. All right. So you're going to take it. Oh, look. I will take it. Oh, look who's here. <laughs> well, pretend I'm not here. Keep talking. <laughs> and then <laughs> folks are in their breakout rooms, and they've been invited back, but they're very happy. There. I'm not here. You can keep talking. Okay. <laughs> The other day, Oren said, and I just couldn't believe, oh, wait, he's here. <laughs> no, I'm not. Flash in the pan. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. How are those breakout rooms? Doing pretty good? <laughs> Need more time. Need more time. Okay, good. Uh, to give Janing's voice a break, I'm going to step in for a minute here and do a little harvesting with all of us together, if that sounds okay with you. I know that we could be in those breakout rooms for the rest of the time, but I know there's a lot of wisdom in those rooms that isn't gonna make it out to the rest of us unless we uh, harvest it in a way. So Janine, can you start screen sharing again so we can see that circle of relevance, opportunity, and action? Uh, Janine kind of primed us with some ideas for relevance that she found from her two stories. And I'm hoping that we have come up in our little breakout rooms with some ideas of opportunities and what's the other one? Actions. <laughs> it's like as soon as it goes off the screen, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, let's start with opportunities and just see who's got something that came out of that discussion that feels um, strong to them and pop it in the chat maybe. If you can type it, if it takes you a minute to reflect, put it in the chat. If you wanna say it out loud, that works too. <coughs> What's on your mind? Thinking about your center.
maybe folks solved uh, the rest of the world's problems in those breakout rooms. <laughs> and if so, we thank you. Um, I'll share, this is Beth Hamlet. Hi. Hi Beth. I didn't, I didn't share this in the breakout, but one thing that's true about our center is that we do have a lot of iconography from various parts of the world. And we could definitely do a better job of contextualizing that for our folks. So that is an action to take. That's helpful. Yep, I'm sure that's true of many centers. Not just iconography, but, but other materials too. I'm seeing a comment here about individual and collective inner work as a staff. So an opportunity to gather, look inward. What can we do as individuals and as a group, specifically around race? Um, an idea about language, uh, switching the conversation from welcome to invitation. Um, it sounds like with invitation, there's a little more intentionality, a little more reaching out specifically. Bill, do you want to say more about that? Is that? Yeah, just uh, again, yeah, it's, it's, it's the mindset. How do we change the mindset? A welcome can be, I think, in, in both our retreat center and also a church community I'm involved in. We're like, well, we're very welcoming, but we're kind of waiting for something to happen. And I think that mindset of we need to be more active. Um, and it's, it's a change in mindset. I think people's hearts are in the right place but there's not an activity to mirror that is what I'm frustrated by. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, Bill, I actually quoted you in our group because a couple of months ago, you talked about reaching out to uh, black communities in Cleveland. And I think that is an opportunity that um, we have here in Tampa that we're not taking advantage of in this way. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Brink. I see a comment here about reaching out to presenters and retreat leaders from other communities or from our own communities to ask how our center can uh, connect with BIPOC retreat participants. So folks who are black, indigenous, people of color who want to participate in a certain kind of retreat, reach out to those presenters and say, how can we connect with this audience? How can we connect with you? How can we serve this audience better? Um, leading workshops on racial justice with co-facilitators um, so that you're bringing in facilitators from both privileged and marginalized identities. Um, so kind of paired facilitators is another opportunity. Uh, one starting point for diversity in a rural um, setting is to bring in the white rural employees whose life experience and belief system is very different. Comment from Christine at Fintorn. There's a value of setting up reading slash reflective study groups um, around various topics. For example, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race, which is by a British author, um, exploring unconscious bias, the lens we view the world. Oren is mentioning um, that COVID creates an opportunity um, as centers close or pause their programming or change the way they deliver programming, can this pause be a chance to rethink our patterns and our programs for when we reopen or the ways that we reopen? New models of collaborative leadership. Collaborative leadership. Janine, am I going too fast for you? In there. I'm, I'm coming <laughs> with the spell check. <laughs> Excellent. Um, continue to offer Zoom retreats and book clubs on racism to continue our education. So that would be education for white bodied folks, I'm assuming. Yes. Um, ben, I have two thoughts that came to mind. Great, thank um, you. The first one is um, to uplifting the, the voices of, of people of color and those experiences because they come with a different perspective and understanding of the situations that they are enduring. 
and um, Dr. Paul Ortiz, which is a professor of history at the University of F Florida, is the author of an African American and Latinx history of the United States. And I think that something like that is really important to see how different, um, how they've played a role within the, within the history. And most oftentimes than that, we're being taught very Eurocentric um, points of view since we we're children. So to try to unlearn that or have a different open mind to it will be challenging, but it's worth um, looking into. I hear something there about centering um, folks' experiences, that it's not necessarily it's both. It's this sort of intellectual, historical, but it's also the experiences that people have in bringing those to the forefront. Correct. Um, Marta mentions writing a statement of commitment, um, an individual commitment also to anti-racism, uh, learning with a resource list. And then the, she details the commitment, all staff and board will sign and eventually all of our program leaders, donors and volunteers will sign. So it's a commitment that keeps rippling outward. And then Justine has posted the link to the book that Yolanda just mentioned. Shall we move to some actions? And some of these are actions themselves as well. But we can Yeah, are there more actions that folks are, are thinking of committing to or have already committed to or see um, themselves committing to, uh, they're sort of at hand. Arlene uh, Peterson offered that she has been doing structural racism at her huge complex there with the poor handmaids and I just reached out to her that maybe we could have that as one of our Zoom programs next because that's another whole important concept for people to understand. Collaboration, right? <laughs> that's what it's about. I think one possible action is the awareness that within the Catholic tradition, uh, Pope Francis is coming out with an encyclical on solidarity and fraternity to perhaps look at those messages and that encyclical and see what kind of programming we can evolve or tease out of that to offer come springtime or fall. So a couple ideas about programming, weaving that programming into your religious or other tradition to give it more roots, but then also really, um, like you said, teasing out the application. Um, Justine has left a message here about working with the board of your organization on understanding personal and institutional racism, starting with education in a common language. Mm. I was going to have trouble typing this, so I, I'm going to say it instead, is, is that we're proactive about our um, gifting of funds and that unfortunately uh, our retreat work a lot of times is to the haves over the have-nots. And are we actually being proactive in our funding? Because even when we give funds, we give it to those who are, okay, I don't have it completely, but I'm, I'm kind of still okay, but I'm going to ask for funds anyways. And, and are we designing programs that we fund to bring in those who don't have the ability or don't even think that's something they can afford at all and actually offering it to those who truly need it in a different sense? No. Yeah, that was hard to type. So. <laughs> Well, I think you bring up a very interesting point, and I don't know if that was your intention, but is the fact that we're at a point where we have to cate categorize what level of poor people belong to. Yeah. And I think that's, um, I don't know, maybe a topic for like a, a different conversation, but when it comes to inclusivity, how do we allow those voices to be heard where they otherwise would not? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I was on a website recently that the organization, a movement organization was saying, we don't want to apply for grants to, to receive funding. We want folks to sign up to our agenda of what we want to be doing in the world. You come to us and say, we want to give you some support to do that good work that you want to do. We don't want to come and ask for it. And I thought, oh yeah, okay, yeah, we could just spin this model. Who, who is in power? Who's doing the work that needs to be done? How can we reach out and find the work that is already in progress and support it further? A comment here from, go ahead, Yolanda. Ben, I'm sorry, I've, I've just, I've got all of these thoughts and ideas, so I'm just gonna throw them at you all. Um, I'm also thinking about, um, we are retreat centers, so how do we create a safe space for all of those people who are doing all the activist work? How mm. do we find a way to feed them spiritually and take a contemplative action towards it rather than having this energy of all of these young voices and have the energy and then all of a sudden they're not being fed? So they almost kind of diminish amongst everything. And I think that that's really part of the reason why there are big movements that begin but don't go, full, go to full completion because a lot of people who are doing this type of work get drained. A lot of social workers who are trying to do work um, in the benefit of others just get wiped out because it's so much. So I think as retreat centers, that's maybe something that we can start analyzing how do we become that refuge for those people who desperately need to be fed spiritually. Another comment in the chat from David. Thank you, David. We're working on shifting decision-making power out from our board and into various committees with a needs-based structure for stipends for committee members. We've talked in the past on community calls about wanting to bring in governance issues as a topic, and I think that would be a really good conversation. Yes, Joanne. Yeah, I am um, a little reluctant to share this um, because I'm very appreciative of all of these actions, like really appreciative of them. At the same time, in the, um, in the breakout group that I was part of, with Kathy and Maureen, I shared with them a, um, a difficult spot that we are in um, at the retreat centers at Loretto. And it was so helpful to me that they took it seriously enough to not suggest an action, like to just stay with the uneasiness of it and to um, think about what the next conversation is that needs to happen. So please, in no way, um, don't hear me say that I'm not, I, I am very grateful for these um, actions and I'm very grateful for the deep listening of the two people that I was in the group with. Thank you, Joanne. Janine, do you want to tie this yeah. together just a little? We have so, about five minutes left until uh, we hit our end point. All right, so I'm gonna close this in one and then ping it back to you, uh, Ben. But um, I'm just gonna zoom out. So in the mural space or in this kind of sort of virtual whiteboard, um, mural is a platform that you, you know, if this was a colla actual collaboration versus Janine, you know, just typing and filling everything in, you all would have your own post-its and we could, populate this together. So um, that's just one thing to say about in the future of work, especially in the remote space, this is something you all could, you know, consider. That said, um, in this way of collaborative visualization, together we've created this. Um, and so um, what's nice, oops, um, what's nice about this is that then we can um, go and reflect or rest, and then come back to this and see what happens in the spaces in between. But we'll clean this up, and um, I wanna thank you all for this journey. So coming back to the bigger picture, you can sort of have a, you know, a roadmap of sort of what we did in 90 minutes. Um, and we'll clean this up and make it a PDF 
Um, it might be a different way as it prints out, but at least you have this to um, reflect on. And I just wanna thank you all, I'm gonna stop sharing now, but um, just thank you all for your collective wisdom and sharing and engaging. Like I said, um, the Jedi work is not a, a beginning and an end, it is not linear. Um, it will continue on. The, the Jedi circles that um, I'm involved in, a lot of the harvesting comes in the spaces in between. So it's not the meetings where we're like, oh, we have an aha moment, but it's the 30 days in between when we meet that it's like, wow, what happened? And, and um, so I know that there's seeds planted. I wish you great harvest, fruitful harvest, um, beautiful harvest. And um, thank you for showing up and giving um, this topic, this very important way of looking at the world, um, your time and hopefully you do harvest. Thank you, Janine, for sharing with us. Um, I wanted to take just a minute or two at the end here to hear from you about what you would like to do next, if you have something on your heart or mind, in terms of our collective collaborative process. In the chat, Jean mentioned, and it's right on cue here. Thank you, Jean, for bringing this up. She said, I'm curious how we can support one another in a few collaborative projects a common book group across a few centers, Jedi and staffing programs, sharing stories and common concerns. How can we connect? Um, what would be most helpful for you? Would you like to do another call like this? Is there another idea that's bubbling up? I don't want to preface too much. I'm curious if folks have ideas. And you can also just populate them in the chat. That way we have a record of it if you don't want to speak it. Um, and again, if there's another thing to uh, harvest in terms of a Word document of chat, you know, um, things, well, we'd be happy to send that out or put it within the mural. I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about retreat centers supporting movements or the movement of movements. Um, what does that look like in a couple different places? And could there be a movement of retreat centers to support the movement of movements? Mm -hmm. yes. Beautiful. I love, I love that idea, Claire. That was beautiful. I'm also, um, Ben, I'm thinking about um, how there are, there's all these young voices and all of these um, spaces that, um, there's this whole energy right and how do how do we allow or invite those young voices to use retreat centers as a way of support um because i, I don't know all of your experience but for for um at least at where i am at the dominican center it's it's a particular um uh, what's the word i'm looking for uh, Demographic. demographic yes demographic and how do we how do we open that space um to those younger voices who have this energy to move forward some of these movements um that we've all want to some way or another support if you have other comments please pop pop them in the chat before we leave we're at our time here. Janine, did you want to play that song before we head out? Yeah, y'all can pop out, but I have one more song. Um, I just love India Ari. She She's just very soulful and um, what do you call it? Her, her lyrics and her music, um, yeah, just really touches. So um, I wish you all 